Now on SportsCenter, ideal conditions at the Masters. We'll get you to Augusta for first round coverage. Clear the snow, let's play ball. Twins take their shots at the Rocket in Fenway. Ruben struts his stuff in the Bronx. The Rangers look to stay perfect. The big unit looks unhittable. Will Nick make nice in L.A.? Today, reaction from the Van Exel suspension. I'm Nick Van Exel. You know, the league can do that to me. <laughs> While Horace Grant becomes the latest to get some unpaid vacation. Tonight's cover story from UConn standout to national team standby. We trace Rebecca Lobo's difficult journey. When someone goes out on the floor, they have to get the job done. And it doesn't matter what kind of... Uh scrapbook they have or awards that they've won you know or any of that stuff we'll check out the sabers new look and new jersey in a devilish situation stretch out and drop everything this is sports center Hi, folks. Welcome to the show. He's Charlie Steiner. I'm Mike Tirico, and Bob Lee's over there to join us in a bit. A record at Augusta will take you there for the Masters first round in a couple of minutes. But first, baseball, Charlie, and a team looking to build off the best start of the 90s. Who'd have thunk it? The Texas Rangers. At the start of play today, there was but one team in Major League Baseball with no losses, the 7-0 Texas Rangers. And there have been no teams that have gotten off to a start like the Rangers since the Milwaukee Brewers, who won their first 13 back in 1987. The Rangers have been doing it with pitching, giving up only 14 runs during their seven-game winning streak. They visited the White Sox at Comiskey Park this afternoon. Bobby Witt and Jason Bure were the starters, neither around at the end. Bottom of the third, Rangers up 3-0. Dave Martinez with a blooper off Bobby Witt. Rusty Greer makes the play. In the bottom of the fifth, 3-2 Rangers. Hudge Rodriguez. One out. Can't handle the wild pitch. Dave Martinez would score all the way from second base, rule the pass ball. White Sox would tie it at three and would lose it twice uh, and would take a 4-3 lead. More trouble for the umpires. Vic Voltaggio tripped over second base and strained his right knee. He was carried off. He'll be okay. Top of the eighth. Rangers down 4-3, but not for long. That's Mickey Tettleton with his second home run of the season. Rangers tying it at 4-4. On into the extra innings. Will Clark gives the Rangers a 5-4 lead. That would be in the top half of the 10th inning. Mike Henneman in trouble in the 11th after blowing a save in the 10th. Lyle Mouton with two on goes the other way. It's a three-run dinger, and the White Sox come from behind and beat the Rangers 8-5. Robin Ventura batting 185 coming into the game, went four for five this afternoon. The Big Hurt went two for five. Rangers lose for the first time this season. Henneman gave up four earned runs in the final inning in the third of the game. Larry Thomas retired all six hitters he faced as he wins his first for the White Sox. Red Sox looking to make it three straight, hosting the Twins at Fenway. Beautiful day for Back baseball. Tom Kelly's four, club catching a few breaks. Top of the second, two out. Roger Clemens gets Rich Becker to pop up. Tim Nairing drifting to the mound. He's somewhere. There he is, and he dropped the ball. E5, runners at first and third. Next hitter would be Chuck Knobloch. Grounded to short. Valentin Should be an easy play, but it isn't. Valentin blows it. One run scores. One nothing Twins. Five Top of the seven, three, two right Twins. Dave Hollins pops it up to right field. Kevin Mitchell yeah, makes the routine look spectacular, but in the process, he pulls a hammy. Top of the eighth, three, two Twins. Two outs. That's Matt Lawton, the ground ball through the legs of Mo Vaughn. Couple of runs score, 5-2 Twins. Bottom of the ninth, 6-2 Twins with nobody out and two on. Tim Nearing. Got the shades, looking stylish. And he goes the other way. That would be a three-run home run off Dave Stevens. Nearing second of the season. Twins leading 6-5, two out. Stevens this time gets Jose Canseco to pop routinely to center field. Roberto, the former Bobby Kelly, the former Roberto Kelly makes the catch. Twins win at 6-5. Three more errors for the Sox, who have now made 12 and 8 games. Brad Radke improves to 3-0, giving up no earned runs in six innings. Gave up four hits, struck out seven, walked two. Roger Clemens threw 129 pitches in six innings. He struck out eight, but he drops to 0-2. Tigers looking to make a clean sweep in their three-game set of the Mariners. This is Dan Wilson in the second inning. No score, but not for long. That would be a two-run shot, a 2-0 Mariner lead. Randy Johnson with an 0-0 through five, getting Mark Lewis swinging one of 12 Ks on the day. Seventh inning, still 2-0. The aforementioned Dan Wilson off Mike Christopher. Wilson would hit a third home run on the day as the Mariners cruise 9-1. to one. Wilson had 12 career home runs coming into the game, hit three of them this afternoon. Edgar Martinez went three for four. Randy Johnson struck out a dozen, walked two and seven and a third.
gave up a run and three hits, and two of them came to Alan Trammell. Mike. Well, Charlie, the biggest surprise of baseball's first 10 days may be that Cleveland has scored just 18 runs in the first 10 days of the season. That is last, 15th out of the 15 American League teams. Kansas City and the Yankees rank 13th and 14th in run scores. Scored, uh, they meet today in the Bronx. Yankees pitching Jimmy Key. Five innings, four runs given up last Saturday. His first start since the Rotator Cup surgery this past summer. Key at the stadium, scoreless in the second. Joe Vitiello hits the fly ball to the center, and Bernie Williams gets twisted around and drops it. Mike McFarland scores 1-0 Kansas City. That changes with Ruben Sierra in the bottom of the second. A rocket off of Tim Belcher to right and serious upper deck. Ruben watched the 1-1 tie. Later, same inning. Yankees on the corners. Andy Fox going. Steals second. Joe Girardi on the other end. Steals home. Second time the Yanks have done that this year. Part of a five-run inning. Key struck out six, but left with stiffness after 71 pitches in the sixth inning. Bob Boone said, he looked as tough as all get up. We'll tell you more about Key in a second. Top seven. Bases loaded. Bob Wickman gets Bip Roberts to hit into a one, two, three. Gets out of the jam. Steve Howe closes. Yanks win 5-3. Key said after the game he warmed up too quick, felt only stiffness, no pain. to be re-examined tomorrow after winning for the first time since last opening day, April 26th. Also today, the Yankees signed Paul Gibson to a minor league deal. He was in their camp this spring. 3-3 three and three Central leading Milwaukee, hosting Oakland. Doug Johns, another strong start, struck out five. He was nearly left back in Arizona. Out of the A's camp. In the eighth, six straight hits, starting with a Mike Bordick single to score Terry Steinbach. Then Ernie Young tomahawks this pitch to left for a double. Two-run score. Young, two for five and three RBI on the day. And Johns continued to cruise. Gets John Jaha here. He had three hits in seven against Detroit and comes back with a shutout in his next start. The pitcher Johns also started three double plays, ending Oakland's five-game losing streak against the Brewers. Milwaukee center fielder Chuck Carr left after six innings with a sore hamstring. He is day-to-day, -day, and so is Charlie. In Pittsburgh, in progress, they've moved to the top of the 11th. Montreal and Pittsburgh tied at five. The Expos rally here, scoreless through the first six, two in the seventh, one in the eighth, two in the ninth. A Rondell White two-run single will keep you updated during the show, as we will on the Padres and the Braves in progress in San Diego. Three-time Cy Young winner Greg Maddox trying to tame baseball's top hitting team. But right now the Padres lead. Tony Gwynn's tarred start continues. He has a couple of hits. Cleveland is at Baltimore tonight. And Albert Bell, he's heating up at the plate, hit his third homer of the season last night. But contract talks between Bell and the Tribe are cooling down. Negotiations have broken off apparently for the rest of the season. Cleveland GM John Hart says, we don't want any in-season distractions over this. Last month, Bell said no to an Indian offer of five years at $38 million. The race for the green jacket at the 60th Masters Golf Tournament got underway this morning, but without veteran Peter Jacobson, who was forced to withdraw because of a pulled muscle in his rib cage that he suffered yesterday morning in practice, Jacobson, who had never finished better than 11th at Augusta, was about to play in his 13th Masters, but Phil Mickelson was in top form today, and Greg Norman was doing even better than that. Norman ties a Masters record today, shooting a 9 under par, 63. He was the odds-on favorite in Vegas to win the Masters at 8-1. to one. They must have known something. Mickelson, on the other hand, shot a 30 on the back nine. He's two shots back. Scott Hoke, Bob Tway are four behind. Bob Tway's never shot below 70 in seven previous Masters. Lee Jansen is four under par. Jack Nicholas today shot a two under par. John Daly was one under. Arnie, two over. Ian Baker Finch was six over. Ian Baker Finch hasn't finished in the top three since 1993. It was a beautiful day in Augusta for the first round of the Masters. Dan Patrick carrying the bags for our coverage of the 60th Masters Tournament. Dan? Thank you, Charlie. Welcome back to Augusta for ESPN's continuing coverage of the 60th Masters. As you mentioned, another postcard day here in Augusta. Temperatures in the 70s, plenty of sunshine, and, of course, some great golf. The 60th Masters began just before 8 a.m. Thursday when 94-year-old former Masters champ Gene Sarazen was given first tee honors. The 1935 champ still swinging strong. Hello once again, I'm Dan Patrick. Jim Colbert, the 1995 Senior Tour Player of the Year, will join me momentarily to offer his expert analysis on the opening round, an opening round that featured Greg Norman in the spotlight. He's been in this spotlight before. 
Six different times, he's finished in the top five. Last year, tied for third. He's been runner-up twice. But he's never had a start like this. In fact, his 9-under-63 bettered his previous best opening round by six shots. Norman spoke with Jimmy Roberts following his historic day. I was really comfortable and relaxed going out there today, Jimmy. I, I felt very good about the way I was feeling. I wasn't hitting the ball that great the first three days, but, uh, you know, I've had uh, a couple of guys in here help me out with, obviously, Butch and uh, my trainer came in. So uh, I felt good going there. You know, when I started getting into a role and, you know, things started feeling real comfortable inside, heck, you know, you just let it happen. Great. Will this start translate into a victory? It has before. Lloyd Mangrum, 1940. Had a 64, finished second that year to Jimmy Demerit, but Ray Floyd, Seve Ballesteros, and Charles Cootie opened up with 65, 66, 66, and went on to win Green Jackets. Jim Colbert, you said yesterday, we'll get a good idea of where Greg Norman will be on Sunday. By how he fares on Thursday, I think Greg exceeded your expectations. Oh, you know, definitely. We were looking for Greg just to have a decent round so that he had a, you know, a chance to stay in the game. In the past, you know, Greg has been accused of maybe not having enough heart or guts to, to really finish a golf tournament. When it really turned out he had a swing flaw and working with Butch Harmon, he's corrected that and he's become a great finisher in the last couple of years. Opening with 63 here, I mean, really makes him the mark. How does this affect the mindset of the rest of the field now going into the second round? Well, the rest of the field now, I'm, they're going to expect Greg to play very, very well. So it's a little scary to him because he's the kind of guy that could go and run away and hide as Mickelson could go with him. So uh, they know that they need to play one special round and two really good rounds in the next three days or they're in big trouble. When we were watching Mickelson, you brought up one word. You said maturity, and here's a guy who's 25. Does he have that maturity now to win this? Well, I think he does. You know, he's won twice this year. He's played in four Masters, and on the 15th hole, where we were watching him, he had a five iron at a pin that you really don't want to shoot at. And he used the discipline. He didn't shoot at it. He put the ball on the green in two, 40 feet to the right hole, two putted safely for his birdie, for, gave up on the eagle, birdie the last two holes, shot 65. That's the kind of maturity that you need to win at Augusta. We'll be back a little bit later on in Sports Center. We'll take a look at how the rest of the field fared on the back nine. Mickelson and Norman had the best rounds. They were uh, they shot 30s on the back nine. We'll also hear more from Greg Norman. For Jim Colbert, I'm Dan Patrick. Now back to you, Bob. Okay, Dan, we'll see you guys in a bit. Ohio probation officials are not waiting for Chicago police to finish their investigation of Mike Tyson. They have already restricted Tyson to the state of Ohio until this matter is resolved. Exactly what Tyson is accused of doing Sunday night in a Chicago nightclub is still unclear. Two friends of the woman who filed the complaint say that woman claims Tyson had kissed her and bitten her face. Others in the club that night dispute the charge. Tyson is living in Ohio, so that state is supervising his probation. The ultimate decision on whether to proceed against Tyson rests in Indiana, and probation officials there are still awaiting the official complaint and a Chicago police report. Well, the Washington Bullets and their vanishing playoff hopes took a body blow last night when George Murison went down with a knee injury and an MRI today revealing a torn ligament. Murison is going to miss six weeks. The Celtics' David Wesley accidentally kicking Murison's leg when he fell. Big George, the only Bullet so far to start every game this year, leading him in boards and in blocks, a contender for the most improved award. Bullets a game and a half out of the playoff picture right now, sitting in 10th place. Judge Rod Thorne brought down the gavel again today, a rather cut-and-dried case after the Rodman and Van Exel affairs. Horace Grant suspended for one game from Orlando and fined $5,000 for last night's tangle with the Cavaliers' Danny Ferry. It went down last night late in the third quarter. Both players got technicals. Afterwards, Grant said Ferry had been pushing and shoving all night long, but it was Grant who shoved him in this confrontation, and Grant is going to miss tomorrow night's game in Orlando against the Pacers. And he had to leave the Knicks by two games for the third western seed. Speaking of the NBA woodshed ahead, we will hear from the Laker guard who has taken up residence there for this moment of peak. Nick Van Exel will speak. And also tonight, the Cavaliers hoping to steal the home court advantage from the team they play tonight. These guys may see a lot of each other. This is Sports Center. Triple-decker pizza from Pizza Hut. Six cheeses, two crusts, and one delicious taste. The guy 
is a psychopath. Tell me you need me. I need you, David. You know you're not at all like what I expect you to be. The guy gives me the creeps. Get away from me! Oh, the call! Let me know! Go to call! Lock your door! You should have allowed nature to take its course. I love you. He wants you bad. Disappear from my family's life. You got that? Fear. Rated R. Starts Friday at theaters everywhere. Did you know that every time you buy one of our beers, you'll get a date? Every time. Honest. You see, every package of ours has a little date printed right on it in plain language. The beer doesn't sell by that day. We take it back. Now, I suppose we could put a secret code on our packages. But then all you get is a blind date. Sports Center is brought to you by Coors Light. Grab a silver bullet and let the mountain come to you. Coors Light. Tap the Rockies. The NBA game of the week, the Phoenix Suns, the LA Lakers, this Sunday at 3.07 Eastern Time. Charles will be there, so will Magic, but Nick's Van Exel will not. And that's because Van Exel will be in the early stages of his regular season-ending suspension of seven games following the shoving of referee Ron Garrison on Tuesday night in Denver. The suspension and fines will cost Van Exel $187,000 out of his $1.9 million salary. Not only do the Lakers lose their point guard and team captain, but on the heels of the Cedric Sabalos disappearing act last month, the Lakers' chemistry must be brought into serious question. Today, Van Exel faced the music and the microphones. Behind the scenes, is, you know, me and him has been going at it for, for three years. But, you know, I could have walked away. I could have just solved the whole thing by just walking away, but I didn't. A lot of times, young players, and I'm not making excuse for any of these players, but somewhere along the way, I think we all need to be taught a very difficult lesson. And that's to say things are not acceptable, and you can say no to players. I wasn't expecting seven games. <laughs> uh, the fine, I don't, I don't know if it was worse than the head, but it probably was a good Hollywood job by him. But I'm Nick Van Eck, so you know the league can do that to me. <laughs> you know, they can take advantage of me. With Van Exel gone for the balance of the regular season, Sedale Threat's going to be the Lakers' starting point guard last night in the Lakers' 21-point win in Minnesota. Threat played 41 minutes, scored 20 points, and had eight assists. Mike? Charlie, important NBA games tonight at home for Miami and on the road for Denver and Golden State. Three teams on the outside of the playoff picture looking in with 10 days left in the regular season. But two teams already in the playoffs also have an important game. Check that as we punch tonight's ticket. In the Eastern Conference playoff chase, the Knicks are currently in fourth place. The Cavaliers are tied for fifth. Two games in back of New York and home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. They meet tonight in New York, and after that, each team has five games remaining. New York has the easier road. Just two of the Knicks' last five games are against teams that currently qualify for the playoffs, a rematch with Cleveland and a game against Charlotte, while the Cavs' final five games are all against playoff-bound teams. Now, tonight's game features an interesting sidebar you see in the last six regular season games between New York and Cleveland, the road team has won. The Knicks also clinched their first-round playoff series last year, beating the Cavs at Gundarina. That road trend may continue tonight if Patrick Ewing continues his woeful 25% field goal shooting at home in his last three games, and if Charles Oakley is unable to play due to the eye injury he suffered when Ewing stuck Oakley with a right elbow that required six stitches under that right eye in Tuesday's win over Boston. Highlights on the late Sports Center and the NBA tonight as this Sports Center rolls on on the same page all season. Now on the page of the record book, we'll show you why. And Monday, Uta Pippig goes for a third straight Boston Marathon title, a race she can't win at the Olympics. Now, Body Shaping, America's favorite TV fitness show, introduces a fabulous foursome of home video workouts. Body Shaping step aerobics to burn fat and lose weight at home. Body Shaping abs to get rock hard abdominals. Body Shaping arms, chest, and shoulders to tone and shape your entire upper body. Body Shaping hips, thighs, and buns to get shapely hips, slender thighs, and firm buns. Come on, you can do this. I know you can. Body Shaping from ESPN Home Video, only $12.95 each. Buy them today. Available at Suncoast Motion Picture Company. 
National Business Employment Weekly, the only publication that updates you weekly on top jobs available regionally and nationwide. All kinds of jobs, professional, managerial, technical, and you'll learn how to land one of those jobs. Get eight job-packed issues for just $35. Also get absolutely free the Job Search Guide. Call 800-292-1400. That's 800-292-1400. The National Business Employment Weekly. If you're not looking here, you're hardly looking. How do you keep up with everything that happens in the NHL every day? You keep your eye on us. NHL Tonight, the ultimate half-hour wrap-up of the day that was in the NHL. Tuesday through Saturday at 10.30 or after the game, only on ESPN2. Five days out from Boston's celebration of running the great marathon, there are Olympic questions swirling about history from one German and excellence from a Kenyan. Also tonight, an American gymnast making a stretch run to the Atlantic Games. Randy Harvey now with our Sports Center Olympic Notebook. Someday, Gideon Boston and Daddy is going to ask how he got his middle name. And his father is going to tell him he was named after the most famous of all marathons. His father might also mention that he is one of the greatest champions of the race's first 100 years. In the centennial anniversary of the Boston Marathon Monday, Cosmos and Detti will be trying to become the first person to win it four straight years. The race also is significant for him because it will serve as Kenya's Olympic trials. In Detti, who spends the night before races writing religious slogans on his shoes, had a prayer answered when officials changed the starting time of the men's marathon in Atlanta from 4.30 p.m. to 7 a.m. That should make the conditions more suitable for a man who has had difficulty running in heat and humidity. Germany's Uta Pippig is favored to become the first woman to win Boston three straight years. But you might want to add an asterisk to that. Two others did it before the women's race became official. You will see Pippig again in Atlanta, but not in the marathon. She plans to run the 10,000 meters. Also Monday, the World Gymnastics Championships begin in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Don't be surprised if Dominique Dawes earns a gold medal and renewed respect entering the final 100 days before the Olympics. Dawes, who has had injury problems, signaled that she is back among the elite in the recent American Classic in Tulsa. She had her usual problems in the compulsories and finished second to J.C. Phelps overall. But Dawes' optionals were extraordinary. Now, the sports insiders say that if Dawes reaches the all-around finals in Atlanta, she has as good a chance as anyone to win a medal. 1994 was the Chinese year of women swimmers. They won 12 of 16 events and set five world records in the World Championships in Rome. Then, embarrassed by drug suspensions of seven swimmers, including two world champions, the Chinese women surfaced only a few times last year. And when they did, they were not world beaters. They had swimmers ranked in the top five in only three events. But if the Chinese championships last week are an indication, this year is going to look more like 94 than 95. In the 100-meter freestyle, the Chinese had two women under 55 seconds in the two best times since the World Championships. They were both considerably faster than the winner of that event in last month's U.S. Olympic trials, Amy Van Dyken. In Los Angeles, I'm Randy Harvey, ESPN. Olympic Notes is brought to you by the GMC Sierra. Strength, style, and a little something on the side. When we continue, George Foster, remember him? He learned what's got more power than his bat in his prime and a longer memory than a pitcher with a grudge. And just when you say to yourself, hey, Bob, what is Tanya Harding up to? She's... Thank you, Charlie. Hey, she's back. The GMC Sierra. This year, it has even more power. And it's always been known for strength. And, of course, style. But we still felt the need for a little something on the side. The convenient new third door. Another first on Sierra from GMC. Right now, check out Honda's solo promo. 
with no down payment, you can get the Shadow American Classic Edition for just $202 a month. Or the Red Hot Magna for $157 a month. Even the Shadow BLX for just $119 a month. How low can we go? Try financing as low as 9.9% APR and no down payment on selected motorcycles and ATVs. Plus, special cash rebates on selected Shadows and all Magnas. So get to your Honda dealer now. We can't stay this low for long. Some days you can't help thinking, man, it sure is easy to lose balls. Well, right now it's just as easy to find balls. Just look inside Michelob Golfers 18 packs for a certificate good for free Ram Tour Balada LB golf balls, redeemable at participating pro golf discount stores or by mail. It's a great way to replenish your ball supply. As far as the rest of your equipment goes, you're on your own. your office equipment ever breaks down, no matter where you are in the business world, remember, nobody responds like Danka. Welcome, my son. Hello, Dolly. Everyone wants to know the facts of life, but look at the jam I'm in. I can fix that. Only Danka offers copiers, fax machines, and digital systems with its world-class commitment to service. You're wise beyond your years, Danka man. So what is the true meaning of life? Leave your number, I will fax you. Danka, world-class products, world-class service. When the state of Connecticut instituted a personal income tax five years ago, a lot of folks were not very happy about this. Trust me on this. But former Major League slugger George Foster, according to state tax officials, has never filed a Connecticut return. Foster was charged yesterday with failing to file in 1994. He made over a half million dollars that year, but he told the state he did not have the $15,000 to pay his Connecticut taxes. Mike. Oh, Bob, no scoreboard watching for the Reds this summer. We're not counting Ray Knight's team out of the pennant race after 10 days. You see, owner Marge Schott has canceled the service that provides out-of-town scores. There have been no out-of-town scores at Riverfront during the first five home games. Schott says it's a cost-saving measure. The score service costs $350 a month. Schott saying about fans, quote, Why do they care about one game when they're watching another? Charlie? From Marge Schott to another woman of the 90s, the lovely and talented Tanya Harding, who is plotting her competitive comeback in skating while divorcing her second husband, setting irreconcilable differences, a marriage that lasted three and a half months. Meanwhile, Tanya was asked the other day if she planned an ice show in Las Vegas. Her answer, quote, don't get any wild ideas here, okay? I'm not going to be performing nude or topless or anything like that, okay? Okay. Still ahead on Sports Center, the Red Wings with the best record of the NHL in years, but and they turn it into a Stanley Cup. Okay? And then there are the Texas Rangers in Chicago this afternoon. Highlights ahead. Just what you need from the cooler that takes your breath away. More oxygen. Introducing the all-new Mitsubishi Eclipse Convertible. It has quite an effect on drivers, too. The new Eclipse Convertible. From Mitsubishi. You know the best way from Terminal A to D in Frankfurt. You know not to plan a business meeting in Rome on August 15th. Everyone's on vacation. You know the fastest calculator in Osaka doesn't need batteries. And now you know the best way to fax virtually anywhere in the world from your business or home office. Only MCI One Fax assures you you'll never have to resend a fax or pay for incomplete transmissions. MCI World, for citizens of the world. The Mets finished up strong last year. In 96, they could be the team to watch in the NL East. This week, they'll tangle with Dante Bichette and the Rockies. The Mets take on the Rockies. The Sunday game of the week, Sunday night at 8 on ESPN. This is where the biggest names in boxing get started. Fighting for a shot at Olympic gold. The U.S. Olympic Trials, Monday at 8 on ESPN. 
Fast Sports Center continues. We take you back. Scotty Bowman, the coach of the last team in the National Hockey League to win 60 regular season games, the 76-77 Canadians. Scotty coaching the 96 Red Wings, going for a win 60 last night at the Joe against Winnipeg. Darren McCarty on the doorstep ties the game at 1-2-1 one. One Wings in the second. Watch the great passing. Jimmy Pusher, Chris Draper, Dino Cicerelli to Draper to Keith Primo on behind 3-1 Detroit still in the second period Nicholas Lidstrom to Iserman no this is the great passing there you go in any case they win 60 games in an 80 game window you see there are 82 regular season games but go back to 1977 when the Canadians set the record that too was an 80 game schedule so it was significant that they did it last night and now as you see with four points two wins in their last two games they could become second on the all-time list for most points in a season. We have reached the halfway point on the Thursday hour. From here, clear down to the bottom of the hour, our cover story. Rebecca Lobo, last year she was riding high as the best women's basketball player on the best team in the country. But this year, the dream team, and it's a whole new world. Also ahead tonight, following Sports Center, the Devils continue their fight for life in the race for the playoffs. Martha Brodeur will need to come up big when the Devils visit the Caps in Landover. We'll go there for a preview in just a few minutes. Boy, boy. And we'll go to Augusta for a review of the first round of the Masters. Phil Mickelson must be feeling pretty good about life its own self tonight. But first, a look at the day's top stories once again. Here's Bob. Nobody's had a start in the American League like the Texas Rangers are enjoying in nine years, and no team this year is getting pitching like the Rangers, who lead the American League with a team ERA of two runs a game. Add to the mix today in Chicago the fact that the White Sox are scoring just four runs a game, and they have not won a single one-run game this year, and the undefeated Rangers looking to leave Chicago happy today. Happy they were that they had a 3-0 lead here on the third. Leave Martinez with a blooper. Here comes Rusty Greer. That's the mark of a hot ball club. Bottom of the fifth. The Sox have gotten it within one. Watch Yvonne Rodriguez. Trouble here. That's a passed ball all the way from second. Dave Martinez. As the Sox build a 4-3 lead. Tough day for the men in blue. The man in blue, Vic Voltaggio, tripped over a base, strained his right knee, had to be taken off on a stretcher. Top of the eighth. Rangers still undefeated, but they're trailing. Can they rally Mickey Tettle in waiting and hitting? And good night. Number two on the year. Rangers tie the game at four. So we go to the 10th inning, and the Texas magic continues. This time, it's Will Clark. Go, baby, number one on the year. The Rangers take a 5-4 to four lead, but Mike Henneman blew the save in the 10th, now in the 11th. A 1-0 pitch to Lyle Mouton with two aboard, and there goes the undefeated start for the Rangers as it nestles into the Comiskey throng. 8-5, to five, the victory for the White Sox, the first loss of the year for Texas in 11 innings. Robin Ventura had been in a slump with a 4-5 for five day today, though. Larry Thomas gets the last sixth for the victory. Bud Rodriguez went deep, as did Tony Phillips. Yankees watching Jimmy Key rather closely today. He's okay here in the second. The question's not Jimmy Key in a scoreless game. It's his center fielder, Bernie Williams. The other way, Bernie. Get the ball. Nah. Mike McFarland scores. It is one to nothing. Now, Ruben Sierra puts this one on the NORAD radar. Second inning, I think it's gone. And he takes the great circle route around the bases. Uh, it's a Cadillac trot if there ever was one. Later in the second, Joe Girardi, the catcher, steals home. Andy Fox on the back end, Girardi on the front end, double steal. Yankees in a five-run second. Now to the fourth key with a strikeout, but he started to tighten up. No pain. It's only his eighth start after surgery, so as a precaution, they do lift him into the seventh with the bases loaded. Bob Whitman, little comebacker. Look at this. Ah, Scooter. Holy cow. One, two, three, and the Yankees win it. You gotta believe it. Great to hear Scooter back on the games. Five to three. Yanks have won five of six at home against the Royals. Jimmy Key's first win since last April 26. Three hits in his five innings. Steve Howe got the last four outs. Ranger uh, Royals, I should say, are 0 4 this year against lefty starters who killed them big time last year. They shoveled out Fenway today, 90 minute delay before the Twins and Red Sox. Might have swung a ball four. Twins need some breaks this year for TK. They got one here in the second with two outs. Where's Tim Naring? Tim's got to find the ball. Cameron's got to find Tim. It's kind of a neutral problem here. E5 putting two aboard for Chuck Knobloch here in that inning. Pitch like that. Sox led the majors in errors last year, and there's John Valentin with an E6 and a 1-0 Minnesota lead at 3-2 in the seventh. Hollins drives one to Hollins with a pop. Kevin, Kevin Mitchell, Mitchell Kevin Mitchell, in. Kevin Mitchell, uh, but he hurts his hammy and had to leave the game. He didn't make the catch. Soon still lead it into the eighth inning, though. 
Matt Lawton and shades of Buckner. Oh, through Mo Vaughn's legs. Two runs come in. It's five to two. But in the ninth inning, Sox are down. Two on for Nearing. In a six to two Twins lead. Nearing makes up for the early miscue. Opposite field shot. Nobody in the bleachers. No one to grab the souvenir. But the Sox only down six to five. And Jose coming up against Dave Stevens. Couldn't do anything with it. Drifting toward right. Twins hang on, and we do mean hang on amidst the sun and the snow and the errors for the 6-5 to five victory. Sox had 12 errors now in eight games. Brad Radke, three victories. The first Twins started to open the year with three straight opening victories in some four years. Seattle in a big rut in Detroit. Dan Wilson, 12 homers in four years. Hey, that's gone. Second inning. Must have been his evil twin today. Here in the second inning, makes it two to nothing. While Randy Johnson had a no-hitter through five, getting Mark Lewis here, one of his count of 12 strikeouts. Dan Wilson, dinger early. Dan Wilson, dinger here on the seventh. Dan the man, gone. This one off Mike Christopher. He took Christopher deep in the next inning as the Mariners finally went in Detroit, 9-1. to Randy Johnson came in with a 7.02 ERA in Detroit, but he went seven and a third, three hits, 12 Ks, his 68th double-digit strikeout game. First win in 10 games for the Mariners in Detroit going back some two seasons. The A's needed some pitching with their hitting. They got the pitching from Doug Johns today against the Brewers. Getting Jeff Cirillo looking. Johns with five Ks and these pitchers smuggled out of town. Oakland in the eighth. This is the big difference. Six straight hits. Bordick with a single. Steinbach scores. And then Ernie Young, who was two for five today, knocked in three. Delivers two right here with a tomahawk shot in a six-run eighth inning to back the pitching of Doug Johns who won eight innings, a five hit, and no walk baseball as the A's win 11 to nothing. Three RBIs for Bordick as well as Young. The A's staff had allowed 10 runs or more three times this year, but they had three DPs turned today. Expo starting a four-game stay in Pittsburgh. This now just the final in 11 innings, 6-5. to five. Expos trailed 4 nothing in the seventh. They uh, were today 5 for 13 with runners in scoring position. It's the second game winner in as many days for Shane Andrews with a solo shot in the 11th to win this game. Also, Greg Maddox up against the Western leading Padres. Top of the ninth now with one out and one on as well as the Padres lead this game 2-1. And Atlanta has something brewing. Andy Ashby with a four-hitter through eight innings. And we understand McGriff is at the plate. We will update this one as we continue. It was a Chamber of Commerce morning in Augusta, Georgia, with a coating of dew on the coffee tables that doubled as the greens at the Masters. That moisture might have encouraged some of the early golfers to get aggressive because once that sun dries the greens, it's terror amidst the tradition. Early on today, the guy to keep your eye on at the Masters. Eventually, Mickelson was passed. Norman went to minus eight. Here he is on 18 going for the course record, looking to tie it, which he did. It is the lowest first round at the Masters ever tying Nick Price back in 86 and 9 under 63. Mickelson with a 30 on the back nine. Scott Hoke with a 67. Bob Tway has never been below 70 in seven previous Masters. Lee Jansen with a 4 under 68. Jack Nicklaus with a 70 today. Of course, the six-time Masters champion John Daly stormed off after a double bogey 18 to blemish that round of 71. Arnie with a 74 and Ian Baker Finch. We told you about him yesterday. Ooh, it doesn't look like he's in line for this cut. We'll have more from Augusta and our crew at the Masters coming up. Big George fell last night, and in a basketball sense, he can't get up. George Mirasane, torn medial collateral ligament, kicked by David Wesley. Mirasane out six weeks, and with the Bullets having six games left, a game and a half out of the playoffs right now in 10th position. Big time bad news for the Bullets. Throw a punch, strike a player on an NBA court, and you're gonna get a vacation from the league office Horace Grant will sit out tomorrow night a one-game suspension for the Orlando forward to go with his $5,000 fine that he received today for last night's confrontation with Danny Ferry of the Cavaliers. The two had been in their private war all night long. Suddenly, it wasn't so private. Both guys got teased. Grant was tossed, and he will sit tomorrow as the Pacers meet the Magic in Orlando. Nick Van Exel is one game into a seven-game suspension, one that's going to wipe out the rest of the regular season for him. Van Exel today refused to apologize to referee Ronnie Garrison for that shove on Tuesday night, saying that he, Van Exel, would apologize when Garrison does, and saying also the two of them have a quiet feud going back for several years. Behind the scenes, is, you know, me and him has been going at it for, for three years, but, you know... I could have walked away. I could have just solved the whole thing by just walking away, but I didn't. A lot of times, young players, and I'm not making excuse for any of these players, but somewhere along the way, I think we all need to be taught a very difficult lesson, and that's to say things are not acceptable, and you can say no to players. I wasn't expecting seven games, <laughs> uh, a fine, 
I don't, I don't know if it was worse than the head, but it probably was a good Hollywood job by him. But I'm Nick Van Eck, so you know the league can do that to me. <laughs> you know, they can take advantage of me. Van Exel did offer some apologies today to his Laker bosses, to his teammates, to Laker fans, to young kids, and to his shoe company, Planet Mea Culpa. The Stanley Cup champions, this is not the final act of the regular season they envision. Their goalie pummeled, benched, and bumming in a critical game tonight. We will check in with the Devils and the Caps as SportsCenter continues. invite you to play the Disney Video Masterpiece Collection Trivia Challenge. The biggest trivia game ever at McDonald's. Pick the right answer to questions about Disney Masterpiece Collection videos and win every time. Over 300 million prizes, like a vacation to Walt Disney World, hot McDonald's food, Disney books from Mouseworks. Come play today. It's going to be magic. The Buffalo Sabres will not be in the playoffs, but nearly 16,000 at the odds today. Why? To see the new logo, a meaner-looking Sabre, and in a shocking development, new uniforms with a prominent color of black. The logo, which is the head of a Sabre, debuts in the new Marine Midland Arena next fall. It's been a quarter century since the defending Stanley Cup champion, the then-1970 Montreal Canadiens, failed to make the playoffs in the following season. Not only are the New Jersey Devils flirting with history, but disaster. They begin the night on the outside looking in with only two games to go. They're two points out, and they visit the Washington Caps in Landover. We've got that game for you right after Sports Center. Gary Thorne and Bill Clement will be calling it. Gary? Charlie, these are great times for sports fans. Not so much fun, though, if you're the team playing on the ice, especially if you're the New Jersey Devils. The Devils won the Stanley Cup last season for the first time in their history. They took this baby home, but last night they didn't play like Stanley Cup champions. A little over six minutes into the second period, Matan Brodeur pulled from the game. The Devils have only two left, and right now they trail Tampa Bay by two for that final playoff spot in the East. So, Bill Clement, a little bitty time left to go in the National Hockey League season. Desperate days for the Devils. Absolutely, and now they have to back in. I think from the Devils' standpoint tonight, there's something that will work in their favor, also something that will work against them. What will work in their favor will be Martin Brodeur. He was pulled last night because he had a bad outing. That hardly ever happens when it does happen. Guys like Martin Brodeur really rebound with strong performances, so I think the Devils will be terrific in goal with Brodeur. What will work against the Devils is the Washington Caps backstop by Jim Carey. A lot of people thought that Olaf Kolzig would start this hockey game tonight because the Devils, or at least the, the Caps, clinched a playoff spot last night, but that's not the way it's going to work. The Washington Capitals want to climb in the standing so they can avoid playing the big three in the East. Philly, the Pittsburgh Penguins, the New York Rangers, Jim Carey, their terrific goaltender is starting in this one tonight, so that will work against the Devils. So, Charlie, that's a great show. Two of the best young goaltenders in the National Hockey League perform here in Washington tonight. All right, Gary, we'll see you in 16 minutes. The Devils and the Caps from Landover right after Sports Center, 7.30 Eastern Time. Gary Thorne and Bill Clement. But still here on SportsCenter, we'll head back down to Augusta for a wrap-up of day one on the 60th Masters. Pretty great day down there. Mm -hmm. Also, the cover story. Her team was number one last year, and so was she. Things are different this year for Rebecca Lobo. Her adjustment a little bit later in this SportsCenter. and network private doctor's offices so you can touch 
in one place or all over the place when you choose HIP. I've gotten help with my golf swing, planned my next vacation. I even get stock price updates every 15 minutes. America Online puts over 100 newspapers and magazines right on my screen. I've got worldwide email, point-and-click internet access, and a great web browser. Plus, new features keep getting added. Call the toll-free number and you'll receive your free startup kit and 15 free hours to look around. It's worth a try. You'll see. USA Basketball Women's National Team is going for the gold in Atlanta. But first, in a possible Olympic preview, they'll face off against China. The USA Basketball Women's National Team versus China, presented by Nike, Saturday at 2, only on ESPN. He's undefeated in 27 fights. He's knocked out 20 opponents. Now, Dana Rosenblatt is fighting for his first world title. Will he walk with the belt? Find out when Rosenblatt meets Howard Davis for the WVU Middleweight Championship, Saturday at 8.30 p.m. on ESPN. The new reloadable smart card. The future is happening now down under and on its way here. From MasterCard, it's smart money. Master's Reports is brought to you by MasterCard. MasterCard, it's smart money. Welcome back to Augusta for ESPN's continuing coverage of the 60th Masters. In case you're asked to join Augusta National, initiation fee $25,000, monthly fees $100. That is, of course, if you're asked to join. Hello once again, I'm Dan Patrick. Jim Colbert will join me momentarily to offer up his expert analysis following the opening round. Yesterday, Tom Watson issued a warning saying that the greens at Augusta were bordering on the edge of difficulty. Tom proved to be quite a prognosticator. His 75 on Thursday, including a five putt on the par three 16. The rest of the field, though, had some pretty fond memories of their opening round. 32 players were under par, but nobody better than Greg Norman. Jimmy Roberts caught up with the first-round leader following Greg's opening round, 9-under-63. Jimmy? Well, thanks very much, Dan. And Greg Norman in the past has had his problems here at Augusta in the first round, but not this Thursday. The last time he shot below 70 was the first time he played here, 1981. And I'm never going to listen to you again because you told me the idea was to play for par. The greens were so hard. Well, I did, but I made a few putts. <laughs> That's all, that was all the difference was, Jimmy. It, uh, I played good. When I uh, got through my first five or six holes, and what people don't realize out there who, who've never been to Augusta National, who've never seen the front nine, they don't realize how difficult the front nine are. Uh, the front nine holes really are. They've got holes, second shots like into, the hardest par three shot we have all day is, a, is the uh, par four, I mean the fourth hole. The hardest second shot we have is into the second shot into five. Uh, you know, those type of things people don't get to see. And, you know, we're really churning our guts out on those shots because, you know, if you miss them, you're, you're in no man's land. So, uh, so you know if you get through those first five or six holes in a comfortable, easy feeling, you know you can take that on to the rest of the golf course because, you know, the back nine, obviously, you can reach the par fives with iron, so you feel a bit more confident. You can be a bit more aggressive. So, uh, but, you know, it's nice to get off to a good start, yes. Um, you know, I'm not much of a statistician, but everybody's reminding me that uh, this is my best score of the, for the opening round. But uh, and it's good because I, I, I feel good about my game and I'm looking forward to the next three days. Greg was first in greens in regulation during the opening round. He had the best front nine score, tied for the best back nine score with Phil Mickelson. Phil Mickelson credited playing with Ben Crenshaw earlier in the week. Ben actually helping him read some of the greens proved to be fruitful. He ended up seven under, just two shots back. Jim Colbert joins me as advertised. Now, you maintain that the back nine at Augusta is feast or famine. Double well, bogeys or bogeys, pars or birdies. It's the best nine holes, tournament nine holes I know of in the world of golf. You can really uh, light it up. And they had some friendly pins today on 14 and 17 and 18. And he, it, 12 was the friendliest I've ever seen it. Behind the bunker, we didn't have to worry about going in the water. But not everybody found it so favorable. But the guys were on top of their game. Of course, they had a chance, and they took advantage today. But it won't be these same conditions tomorrow. No, no. Be a little, it won't be as user-friendly as it was today. For Jim Colbert, I'm Dan Patrick. Let's go back to Sports Center, Mike.
Dan and Jim, thanks. As SportsCenter continues the cover story, the adjustment for Rebecca Lobo. How to deal when you're the best-known player, but not the best player on Team USA. Oh, bathroom. Oh, bathroom. Bathroom, bathroom. Oh, yes. Where you stay, shouldn't be. Fairfield Inn by Marriott. Don't forget, Gracie, this one is a par five. Oh, dear, I better give it all I've got. A dual scratch golf. Win any of 21,000 prizes instantly in 12-pack cans of O'Doul's. I win a tailor-made burner bubble. Yeah? Yeah, you need it. You drive like an old lady. Thanks. I really spanked that one. What kind of superstition does Mike have around the playoffs? Okay, because there's a few things that I would prefer you didn't ask me about. He did have a ritual with underwear, and when he was on a winning streak, he would wear the same underwear. So he might be wearing the same underwear for two months? Yes. We all assumed that he washed it from time to time. And they have little blue polka dots on them and fish. No, he definitely doesn't want me to talk about it. They had little fish on them. And now the debate is go with the fish for the playoffs, the stripes of the polka dot. But we, we aren't going to film these, right? U.S. women's national basketball team just recently touring China, now hosting the Chinese team live action on ESPN. That'll be Saturday afternoon, 2 Eastern time. One of the players on that U.S. women's team is perhaps the most well-known women's collegiate star of the 90s, Rebecca Lobo. Last season, she led UConn, Connecticut, through an undefeated run to the national championship. But the American fans who feasted on Lobo's NCAA moments are largely unaware of the class of older American women's players who have honed their games overseas through years of very competitive play. A difference that is most glaring as Rebecca Lobo fights to hold on and maybe qualify for a spot on the final American Olympic roster. Steve Cyphers reports tonight's cover story. By the time Rebecca Lobo left Connecticut, she'd become a national champion, a player of the year, and the most recognizable athlete in women's basketball. When she was named to the U.S. national team last May, she joined women who were much more experienced and accomplished in international play. But when the team took to the road for a 20-game tour of college campuses last fall, it was Lobo whose autograph fans sought, and Lobo whose quotes reporters wanted. This, though Lobo was not the star, but rather a struggling sub. Well, it's a tough situation if you can imagine going to an open practice or to a game and, and when the lineup is announced, my, my name might get the same, maybe the most applause. And then Katrina McLean is out there just doing unbelievable things on the court. Lisa Leslie is scoring 20 points a game. And, and Teresa Edwards, who's already been in three Olympics and done so much for the game of women's basketball. Uh, and I'm just this young kid coming out. It was difficult for her and it was also hard on the rest of the team because, uh, you know, here they've been kind of playing maybe, um, you know, a little bit maybe overseas and people haven't heard about them. And along comes Rebecca. And what she kind of has, I think, done a really good job at, she said, well, people will come out to watch me and then they'll see them. Was there ever any resentment on this team's part? No, because we understand that it's the public's ignorance in that sense that uh, they only know what they see. And what they saw from Lobo on the college tour was not what they remembered from her days at UConn. Then she averaged 17 points and 10 rebounds a game. On tour, it was just six points and four and a half boards. And there were rumors of a rift between the player and the coach. I think that that's um, really um, unfair to Rebecca, and it's unfair to me. Um, you know, when someone goes out on the floor, they have to get the job done. And it doesn't matter what kind of um, scrapbook they have or awards that they've won, you know, or any of that stuff. I've never felt like, um, you know, that there's been a rift between us. Uh, you know, I really think that she wants me to play well, and I want to play well. She struggled early. She was playing up against players that are as big or bigger, you know, as quick or quicker, and uh, it, it was hard. She was uh, trying to play a finesse game, and she's got too big of a body to be finesse. She's got to learn how to use her body to her advantage, um, especially on defense. While Lobo is known from the start that a spot on the Olympic team is not guaranteed, she's never had any doubts about making it. 
until a February 5th USA Today article suggested Vanderveer might consider making changes. When that article came out, it made uh, a sense of urgency for me that you only have, um, you know, you only have another month to prove that you deserve to be on this team, and that's my goal. Soon after, the national team went to China, where Lobo finally became a factor. In one game, she led all scores with 24. Two days later, she recorded her first double-double with 17 points and 11 rebounds. And I just asked her, what was the difference of, about the China trip? And she just felt like she had nothing else to lose. She got kind of broke out of my shell finally in China, and I felt like the person I was when I played at Connecticut. I just felt more free. I think it had to help her confidence. I think it helped her confidence in herself, her teammates, and coaches. I think a lot had to do with the fact that I became a lot closer with my teammates off the court. It had taken more than five months and a trip halfway around the world for Lobo to feel at home, to feel like she belonged. When we started together in the fall, you know, she was just really shy and she'd be on the phone all the time. And, you know, I think she was kind of trying to find her place and that was sort of hard, but I never wanted to push her. You would reach out to her and she would reach back as long as you reached to her. But sometimes you got to give too. They've always, I think, been ready to welcome me. It's just a matter of was I ready to be welcomed. I realized the situation she stepped into coming out of college and having had the opportunity to play overseas. Um, she has a lot of growing up to do and she's forced to do it really fast. And um, to her credit, she's doing it. Lobo calls them adjustments. Leaving family and friends, living far from home, learning a new way to play the game with new people. All that has made her road to Atlanta a rough one, but it is getting smoother. I think that what I admire most in her is her mental toughness and that, you know, things haven't gone her way and she's handled it very, very well. Yeah, I can't say I have any regrets because I think the, the reason I'm playing better now is because what I learned from earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be a part of this team. I thank God every day that I'm on this team and I'm ex very excited about it and I think I've learned a lot from it. Well, admittedly, any player on a so-called dream team is not really going to have monster numbers in minutes or points or boards. Saturday's game in Philadelphia is the final one for the ladies before a trip to Australia, and then they come back to meet Cuba in Rhode Island in late May. The final roster cuts will be made June 19th. By that date, it's been made clear to everybody on Tara Vanderveer's team that nobody has a guarantee. On the ice, the defending champions have their backs up against, well, uh, the Pipes. Tonight in Landover, over two points out against the playoffs, and Monsieur Brodeur has got to produce tonight. Next time, call Allied. Allied, utterly obsessed with the care of your belongings. Utterly obsessed with the care of your belongings. Nine percent financing for 24 months or zero payments, zero interest, and zero down for six months. Mr. Gammons, you're an outstanding American citizen, aren't you? Yeah. And you do what's best for your country. Well, of course. Well, okay. Whenever you uh, do a, your show on baseball tonight, always make a point to mention that Hadeo Nomo is from uh, New Jersey. But it's for your country. Yeah, you know, Japanese accent, Jersey accent, roughly similar. Hey, I'm Melito Perez from Atlantic City. No. Yeah. Sports Center is brought to you by MasterCard. MasterCard, it's smart money. And by Yamaha Wave Runners. They do things other watercraft don't. Tony Gwynn went two for three today. He's now batting 528. Padres beat the Braves two to one. Greg Maddox, his first road loss in almost two years. He had won 19 straight until today. A perfect game in bowling is pretty good. It's really, really good. 12 strikes in a row. And then there's Norm Duke, who bowled three 300 games in a row last night at the Johnny Petraglia Open in North Brunswick, New Jersey. 
36 straight strikes. Officially, that's the first time it's ever happened. Unofficially, two other bowlers had done it before, but it was never officially recognized by the PBA. Mike. Quick check of news and notes. Keith Van Horn will stay at Utah for his senior basketball season. Ozzie Smith, 15-day DL with his hamstring injury. Baseball tonight at 10.30 and midnight Eastern. Next, Sports Center at 11 with Gary Miller and Keith Overman. For Bob Lee, I'm Mike Tirico. And I'm Charlie Steiner. We'll see you again tomorrow.